Hi, everybody. I know we only have an hour. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. Some of you know me, but for those of you who don't, um, my name is Nomi Stolzenberg, and I'm here visiting this year from the University of Southern California Law School, um, and I'm really delighted to be here, um, in particular, to be able to share some thoughts about um, what not just I, but I think many people have come to understand, perhaps somewhat belatedly, is an extremely urgent issue which concerns the interpretation of the free exercise clause. So um, I want to talk in particular about one of the last cases um, uh, of the 2020 term, uh, which is what I refer to as the cliffhanger. That was the case of Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. Shout out to Philadelphia. Um, uh, which left us with a cliffhanger, which I'm about to describe. Um, so what was Fulton about? Um, the specific issue raised in Fulton was whether a Catholic family service agency, one that happened to be in the city of Philadelphia, um, uh, that engages in, the, in, in pro providing foster care services, um, whether uh, it has to abide by Philadelphia's regulations, requirements that are embodied both in Philadelphia's uh, civil rights ordinance, its public accommodation statute, and then we're also um, further, the same requirement was embodied in the contract between the city of Philadelphia and the Catholic Family Service Agency, because the city essentially subcontracts with private agencies to perform the public function of uh, uh, providing services to children who are deemed to be in need of foster care. Um, the question is whether the city requirements embodied both in the contracts with the agencies and in uh, Philadelphia's public accommodation statute, namely that uh, any uh, either public agency or private uh, entity that provides services to the public or performs public services has to um, abide by the requirement not to engage in discrimination, including not to engage in sexual orientation discrimination. So the Catholic Foster Services Agency um, was seeking and claimed that it had a right under the Constitution, under the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment, to be exempt from that regulatory and contractual prohibition on sexual orientation discrimination. Um, that is to say, it wanted to maintain the right to refuse to place uh, children in need of foster care with same-sex couples. So that was the specific issue in Fulton. And the court unanimously ruled in favor of the Catholic agency. But the big issue that was left hanging, right, so this is where we get to the cliffhanger, was what is the, what, what is the governing doctrine under which issues like this should be decided. The still uh, established precedent um, is a case from 1990, Employment Division v. Smith, uh, that stated that if you're talking, if a claim is brought to a religious exemption, exemption from a regulation that is neutral and generally applicable, that's not subject to a free exercise challenge. That was the holding in the 1990 Smith decision. But to give a more complete description of the doctrine yielded by Smith, essentially what Smith says is, if a law is neutral and of general application, it's not subject to any free exercise challenge. 
which is to say there's no right to religious exemptions from laws that are neutral and of general application, unless, and then Smith recognized two exceptions to his general rule of no right to religious exemptions from neutral laws of gen general application. Um, one, for, for what it referred to as hybrid rights situations, that's to say if the neutral law of general application impinged on another constitutionally protected right in addition to the right to the free exercise of religion, such as the right to free speech or parental rights. In that case, uh, Smith recognized as an exception to its general rule that strict scrutiny would apply and therefore challengers would have a right to a religious exemption unless the state could meet the heavy burden imposed by strict scrutiny of demonstrating that it had a compelling state interest that could not be achieved through any less restrictive means. So that was one exception, the so-called hybrid rights exception. And the second exception recognized in Smith was for situations in which there's a mechanism for making individualized governmental assessments of uh, an individual or an individual entities of a private entity or individual's eligibility for benefits or exemptions. To complete the, 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 the universe, according to Smith, that means further that if a law is not neutral and generally applicable, Otherwise put, if a law, if the if if a law is targeting a religious practice, so that the burden on the ability to engage in the religious practice isn't just an incidental effect of the purpose of the pursuit of some other purpose. If the very purpose of the law is to burden <laughs> the free exercise of religion, then Smith's rule of uh, no strict scrutiny, no free exercise challenge, no right to exemption doesn't apply because it only is a rule that pertains to rules and regulations that are neutral and of general application. That was a regime that at least um, in its original incarnation seemed to give pretty strong protection to governmental actions, such as the enactment of civil rights ordinances, that are neutral and generally applicable, that aren't targeting religious practices, but that merely have an incidental effect, the incidental effect of substantially burdening the exercise of a religious practice. Three justices in Fulton, in a very lengthy opinion <laughs> written by uh, Justice Alito, vehemently expressed the view that the time has come to overturn Smith and to replace it with what? With the doctrine supposedly yielded by an earlier case the very first case in which the United States Supreme Court recognized the existence of a right to a religious exemption under the Free Exercise Clause, namely the 1963 decision of Sherbert versus Verner, which is broadly understood, and I am going to very idiosyncratically argue here today, misunderstood, as standing for the proposition that all laws, all state action, all neutral and generally applicable laws 
and all laws that aren't neutral and generally applicable, that any state action that has the effect, whether it's incidental or targeted, of substantially burdening the exercise of religion is subject to strict scrutiny, which means that unless the state can demonstrate a compelling interest that can't be achieved through less restrictive means, an exemption, or depending on the circumstances, whatever is the most appropriate means of accommodating the religious practice in question must be granted. Okay? So, according to almost everyone, that's the choice. Either Smith which protects neutral laws of general application from free exercise challenges, except in the two exceptional situations I enumerated, or overturn Smith and go back to Sherbert, which never was overruled, um, but reinvigorate the, the Sherbert test, which supposedly um, is what I just said. Okay? This is, that choice is oftentimes phrased or glossed as a choice between uh, uh, interpreting the free exercise clause as protecting uh, religious people or religious practices only from intentional discrimination, targeting, that's supposedly what Smith held insofar as it drew this basic dichotomy between, on the one hand, laws that are neutral and generally applicable, where the burden on religion is incidental, not the purpose, as opposed to, on the other hand, laws that are not neutral and generally applicable, meaning precisely that they have the purpose many people would say, the discriminatory purpose of targeting religious exercises, right? So should we interpret the free exercise clause as protecting people from both intentional and unintentional forms of religious discrimination, which supposedly is what going back to Sherbert will give us, or as only protecting people from intentional forms of religious discrimination, save for those two exceptional situations. Surprisingly, even though Justice Amy Coney Barrett had just joined the court that term, and even though both she and Justice Kavanaugh were widely expected to be in agreement with the two justices who joined Alito's opinion, namely Justices Gorsuch and Thomas, it was widely expected that at least those five conservative justices, and perhaps others, uh, that, that they all would agree with the position adopted by Alito, Thomas, and Gorsuch that Smith should be overturned. But, to many people's surprise, Justice Barrett, in a separate concurring opinion, joined by Justice Kavanaugh, balked at the prospect of overturning Smith. She didn't say we shouldn't overturn Smith. She actually said, joined by Gorsuch, that she finds the arguments uh, against the soundness of Smith, against the soundness of Smith's interpretation of the free exercise clause to be much more convincing than any defenses of Smith that have been advanced. So she and Kavanaugh made it clear they too think the time has come to overturn Smith. But what the two of them said in the concurring opinion authored by Justice Barrett is, but we're not so sure what it should be replaced by. Whereas the three other justices, Alito, Thomas, and Gorsuch said, obvious, you know, the, the obvious alternative is Sherbert, as I have described it. Um, Justice Barrett's opinion didn't even refer 
to Sherbert as the alternative. Instead, she characterized the position conventionally associated with Sherbert as a strict scrutiny regime, which she described as being equally categorical as Smith, right? So she said, as between the two alternatives, that seem to be the only alternatives people are talking about, on the one hand, Smith's categorical rule that neutral laws of general application are not subject to strict scrutiny, in fact, aren't subject to free exercise challenges at all, and what she called the equally categorical strict scrutiny regime that would subject any state action that substantially burdens the exercise of religion to strict scrutiny. She said, and Justice Kavanaugh agreed, we're not so sure that's such a good alternative. We would like to find a third way. And so <laughs> they withheld <laughs> the two votes that would have resulted in overturning Smith. So what's going to happen? We don't know. What should happen? I find Justice Barrett's uh, uh, challenge to try to identify a third approach, an alternative, to both the strict scrutiny regime conventionally associated with Sherbert and uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, categorical insulation of neutral rules of general application, that is to say, the denial of any protection from unintentional forms of religious discrimination, seemingly associated with Smith. Um, Justice Barrett has challenged us to find an alternative to either the categorical denial of any protection from unintentional religious discrimination or the equally uh, uh, categorical strict scrutiny regime associated with Sherbert. I, I, I welcome that invitation. Um, uh, and I hope very much, although I don't really have a lot of optimism from my point of view, we get accepted uh, by Justice Barrett or the rest of the court. But the opening is there to make an argument, and that's what I want to share with you. So in other words, I agree with Justice Barrett that the choice between Sherbert and Smith, as it's been stated, is the only choice we have. In fact, I think <clears throat> that it's a false choice. So I want to explain what my position is, which I have to, uh, I think, admit is highly unorthodox and, and at odds with almost everyone else's interpretation of Sherbert. But before I do that, um, I think it's important to say a little bit about how we got here. How do we get to this fork in the road? Um, First of all, in order to get a better understanding on what the, the, the two primary options are, what, what is the Smith doctrine, what did Smith hold, both you know, as it's been understood or misunderstood and what it actually held and, and, and what was Smith all about. So I want to say a little bit about just sort of the origins of the Sherbert doctrine and then how things developed in the years uh, uh, between 1963 um, and 1990, when Smith came down, and then what's happened since 1990, which has brought us to the moment we, where we are today. Um, and then I want to say a word, uh, having delivered you all, I hope, to sort of a place of having a good understanding of where we're coming from and where we are today, how other people have responded to Justice Barrett's challenge, and then I'd like to leave you with my own unorthodox view. So how did we get here? Um, well, as I've already said, um, Sherbert v. Verner was handed down in 1963, um, recognizing for the very first time, it was the first time the Supreme Court said that uh, people in this case, it was one individual, a Seventh-day Adventist by the name of Adele Sherbert, 
um, uh, that when a person such as Mrs. Sherbert um, is burdened in her ability to exercise her religion by state action, the government has an obligation to accommodate her, to find a way to enable her to engage in the, in the religious exercise that the government action is otherwise burdening, unless it can demonstrate the existence of a compelling state interest that can't be achieved through less restrictive means. This is 1963. Two cases earlier that term had applied the compelling state interest test to free speech cases involving the NAACP and communist witch hunts. Prior to 1963, the compelling state interest test didn't exist. So Sherbert, it's important to understand, was the third of a trilogy of cases in the, in, in the 1962 term, ending in 1963, that adopted the compelling interest test for the first time, thereby bringing strict scrutiny, as we know it, into existence. It didn't exist before this term. And Sherbert was the very first case to apply it to a free exercise case as opposed to a freedom of speech and freedom of political association claim, which the other two cases earlier in the term were. Which is to say, it was the first case that applied it in a way that yielded the result of requiring the accommodation of the religious practice um, absent the demonstration of a compelling state interest unachievable through less restrictive means. The opinion didn't make a lot of waves. There wasn't a single newspaper article that covered it the day that came down. A lot of other stuff was that. A lot of other controversial stuff was happening that term. A Sherbert wasn't controversial. You know, word gets out. Um, everybody liked it. Nobody objected to it. Um, it. It was a quintessential liberal Warren Court decision, Brennan decision. Um, it, was, it was promoted by liberal civil rights and civil liberties advocacy groups. Religious conservatives found nothing to object to in it. They liked it. Everybody liked it. It was a, a totally consensus view, um, at least until the 1990s. So what happened in the 1990s to, to, to render this doctrine that nobody objected to, everybody liked, um, controversial. Well, the first thing that happened was the handing down of the Smith decision in 1990, which really surprised and confused a lot of people. The Employment Division v. Smith opinion, it was a narrowly decided 5-4 decision in which a majority of the court, in an opinion authored by Justice Scalia, the late Justice Scalia, that was the opinion that seemingly narrowed uh, uh, the application of the Sherbert Doctrine of strict scrutiny uh, uh, to be applied to neutral laws of general application, um, save for uh, the very exceptional situation, or maybe not so exceptional situation, uh, where there is a mechanism in place or the possibility of granting exceptions and otherwise having a, a, a process uh, whereby the government engages in individualized assessments of whether or not a particular private party is subject to the requirements of the neutral, generally applicable rule or exempt from it. So Smith, Smith, it's, it's written by a, a, not just a conservative judge, justice, the justice who, who is widely regarded as, as the, the father of, of the conservative legal movement. Um, virtually all of the conservative justices on the court today, they very much see themselves, represent themselves as, as, as adherents of Justice Scalia's philosophy judicial philosophy. Yet, <laughs> this was an opinion, the opinion rendered, written by Justice Scalia, 
uh, was, was widely repudiated by conservatives, by religious conservatives, by judicial conservatives, by economic conservatives, but especially by religious conservatives. So that's a bit of a puzzle. It, I don't want to linger on it for too long because we have other things to cover. It's a puzzle that's not too difficult to resolve. I think what, what the fact that it was Justice Scalia who wrote this opinion, which most judicial conservatives and, and religious conservatives then, when the decision was handed down and up until today, think is an outrage. This is the decision they think has to be overturned. How do we make sense of conservatives on both sides? I think it reveals uh, uh, divisions and tensions within conservative thought. I mean, in fact, Justice Scalia's opinion in Smith is perfectly consistent with many tenets of his conservative judicial philosophy of conservatism in general. It was very much in keeping with the kind of law and order, anti-anarchy, judicial restraint, judicial deference to uh, uh, decisions made by the legislative and executive branches. Smith is perfectly consonant with those quote unquote conservative values. That's, that's, that's one aspect of conservatism. And another aspect of conservative legal thought and political thought that's very much in tension with the one I just described is the more libertarian anti-government strain, right? So Justice Scalia's opinion in Smith is very much at odds with the libertarian anti-government strain of conservatism, but it was completely in keeping with the basically pro-government, law and order, uh, anti-anarchy, judicial restraint, judicial deference to the government strain. So it revealed tensions within conservatism. But Smith, at the time it was handed down in 1990, did not divide liberals and conservatives. <laughs> right? It divided conservatives and internal division, but it didn't divide liberals from conservatives. In fact, most religious conservatives, virtually all religious conservatives, and, 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 and probably the majority of conservatives, some maybe sided or had some sympathy with Justice Scalia's view, were united with most liberals in thinking that Smith was an outrage and that it should be overturned. And in fact, these two forces, I mean, it's sort of unthinkable now, this kind of strange bedfellows, um, but it was liberals, liberal civil rights and civil, civil liberties advocacy groups joined with religious conservatives to advocate for the passage of the federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That was actually the consensus view amongst, shared by liberals and conservatives, that we need to get rid of Smith and go back to Sherbert. But then the second thing that happened in the 1990s is something that created a wedge between liberals and conservatives. What happened later in the 1990s is that Christian conservatives began to file lawsuits claiming that they had a right under the Free Exercise Clause to a religious exemption from civil rights laws. Sound familiar? Right? So that's sort of the Fulton argument was made earlier in cases going back to the 1990s. The first cases, as far as I know, in which this strategy was mounted um, by conservative Christians, they were fair housing laws cases. There's one in out. And by the way, these never reached the Supreme Court. Now, actually, there was a precursor to this. Um, in 1983, Bob Jones University, an evangelical Christian university, it had already made a version of this argument. Um, when it claimed it had a right under the Free Exercise Clause, and this is before Smith, right? Um, 
in the ostensibly protective of religious exemptions and religious liberty regime of Sherbert in the Sherbert era, Bob Jones University um, objected to having to comply with an IRS regulation that says that any uh, uh, nonprofit entity like Bob Jones University that receives that has tax exempt status has to uh, uh, comply with the regulatory requirement not to engage in race discrimination. But Bob Jones had long had uh, a, rule, a rule prohibiting interracial dating amongst its students, and they didn't think it should have to give up that rule in order to maintain its tax exempt status. And it argued that under Sherbert, it had a right to be exempt from the non-discrimination, the prohibition on race discrimination rule uh, enacted by the IRS. Bob Jones University lost, query, if that, if that would it lose today? Is the case going? I'm not so sure, but I'll leave that to you to ponder. Um, back then in 1983, this was not an argument that had a lot of traction. And then there, if there were other such claims being brought, they, they were not, there weren't a lot, they weren't very visible. But by the mid-90s, by the late 90s, that was really changing. So you started seeing conservative Christian landlords saying, uh, wow, our, our city has enacted, it's, it's expanded its, its uh, civil rights ordinance. Now we're not allowed to engage in marital status discrimination. But we don't want, this was before the early ones were not even talking about LGBTQ rights. We don't want to have to rent to unmarried couples, heterosexual couples who are, according to our religious beliefs, they're living in sin. We don't want to have to rent to them. You're talking about landlords who fair housing laws exempt owner-occupied homes and um, landlords who have four units or less. So you're talking about landlords of larger scale properties. This is the claim they made. So you start seeing the, Sh the Sherbert Doctrine, so-called, being employed more and more as a weapon, many people say, a strategy for uh, uh, enabling people of faith, of, with traditional religious values, to make a claim that sh they should not have to comply with laws that embody uh, uh, values of racial equality or marital equality, as the case may be, um, that violate their religious convictions. That strategy of using uh, uh, something like the Sherbert Doctrine to try to carve out exemptions from civil rights laws really accelerates as we go deeper into the 90s and into the 20s and the gay rights movement and the broader LGBTQ plus movement begins to really score its first legal victories, right? So in 1996, we have the Romer decision, one of the first gay rights victories. In 2003, Lawrence, right, um, overturning uh, the earlier decision, upholding the constitutionality of sodomy laws. Now in Lawrence, uh, in 2003, the Supreme Court sides with the gay rights position. Um, you cannot criminalize gay sex. You cannot c criminalize same-sex sexual acts. That's the same year, by the way, in which the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court in Goodridge um, says it's unconstitutional to restrict marriage to same-sex couples. So now the, the movement for marriage equality is really has momentum, right? Um, then we get uh, uh, the 2013 Windsor case.
handed down by the Supreme Court saying uh, uh, it's unconstitutional, a, a law um, uh, prohibiting federal government from recognizing same-sex marriages. That's unconstitutional. So in response to these gains by the gay rights movement and the LGBTQ plus rights movement, we see an acceleration <laughs> in the number of claims um, that are being brought in response by conservative Christians saying, well, we have a right to religious exemptions from these laws. And so that's what brings us now, we're at 2014, the Hobby Lobby case, right, where the Supreme Court sides with the challengers um, who claim that as business owners, they have a right to a religious exemption under RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, from the so-called contraceptive mandate of so-called Obamacare. I say so-called because uh, uh, the regulation in question didn't actually mandate that businesses have to cover contraception. It mandates that every insurance plan has to cover uh, uh, contraceptive services, um, and ex a right to a religious exemption from that mandate, from um, employers having to make contributions to plans that cover contraception, was recognized um, in Hobby Lobby. Um, then the next year, you get Obergefell, uh, the marriage equality case. 2018, you get Masterpiece Cake Shop, signing with uh, the wedding cake baker who doesn't, who says, I have a right to be exempt from the local civil rights ordinance that applies to public accommodations statutes, uh, that applies to public accommodations prohibiting sexual orientation discrimination. I should not be obliged to sell cakes that are wedding cakes that will be um, served and eaten in, in gay weddings, same sex weddings. So you can see how these two things are interacting with each other each other, um, and, and that, that is what brings us to the present day, where you have a movement, right? You have a conservative movement that since Smith was handed down has been as dedicated to getting Smith overturned as it has been dedicated to getting Roe versus Wade over. and having Smith replaced by going back to Sherbert. Now, as I said, originally, the goal of overturning Smith and returning to Sherbert was shared by liberals. But in the face of these challenges to civil rights laws, a lot of liberals and progressives who were originally in support of uh, returning to Sherbert and getting rid of Smith had second thoughts, okay? So now most advocates who are trying to defend the enforcement of civil rights ordinances against religious objectors and likewise to defend the enforcement of public health laws, like vaccination mandates, or if you can still remember COVID regulations against religious objectors. Not only have advocates who want to defend the enforcement of these neutral laws of general application against religious objectors had second thoughts about Smith, a lot of them have had second thoughts about Sherbert um, and have sought to argue that actually the free exercise clause is properly interpreted as only protecting people from intentional religious discrimination, from government actions that intentionally target religious practices. And it, it, has, it doesn't protect people from neutral laws of general application. Um, that just happened to have the incidental effect of burdening the free exercise of religion. No protection from unintentional religious discrimination. So that's the choice, right? 
That's the choice that most people thought is on the table, except for Justice Barrett, joined by Kavanaugh, who says, you know, maybe there's a third way. So let me try to wrap up by addressing the possible ways of responding to Justice Barrett's challenge um, to find an alternative to both the categorical denial of any protection from unintentional forms of religious discrimination and the categorical application of strict scrutiny to any law and any neutral law of general application. So I want to share with you my view about the alternative that exists, my unorthodox view. But I want to make it clear there are other, perhaps more respectable options on the table. Um, so what are the other responses that have been given to Justice Barrett's challenge? Well, one that I don't think is, you know, whatever you think of it on its merits, um, I don't think is destined to get very far, is what I just referred to, is that many liberal advocates have adopted the strategy of arguing, we got to stick with Smith. Keep Smith. Resist the overturning of Smith. Um, I think that's not a good strategy, not only because I don't think it's destined for success, but also I think it's wrong to interpret the free exercise clause as denying any protection from any unintentional form of discrimination. In fact, I mean, that's the position, I, I put myself in this camp, <laughs> cards on the table. Um, I share the objectives of liberals and progressives who want to defend the enforcement of civil rights laws, of COVID regulations, of many other laws. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about discrimination on the basis of race, gender, disability, sexuality, liberals and progressives are the ones to insist upon a broader definition of protection from discrimination to include unintentional forms of discrimination, structural forms, systemic forms of discrimination. I don't think we should abandon that. For on what basis do you say, I mean, currently, both the liberal camp and the conservative camp sort of exhibit mirror images. The conservative camp basically says, when it comes to race, gender, sex, disability, anything other than religion, we demand a discriminatory intent requirement. But when it comes to, to religion, no, no, we have to have a compatious, we need to recognize that even genuinely neutral laws with no discriminatory purpose, nonetheless, we should recognize that when they have the discriminatory effect of burdening some religious groups, that's a form of discrimination that, we, that, that people deserve protection from. And then it's exactly the flip that we see amongst many liberals and progressives today where they're rejecting the argument that the free exercise clause should be interpreted a la Sherbert to protect people from unintentional forms of religious discrimination. They're saying it only protects people from intentional targeting of religious practices, whereas they want to maintain uh, the importance of recognizing and protecting people from unintentional systemic institutional structural, and indeed cultural forms of discrimination. I don't think, I, 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 think, I think we should recognize that across the board. So the, so the stick with Smith strategy that's being advanced by some of my friends, I just, I don't think that's the right way to go. Now, I should note that in the wake of Dobbs, it's not only liberals who seem to be having second thoughts about overturning Smith and going back to Sherbert. Because of course, what happens the year after Fulton, which brings us to this crossroads, this cliffhanger, we get Dobbs. And what happens after Dobbs? 
Well, there are liberal, and not only liberal, other religious groups who say categorical restrictions on abortion are in conflict with our religious beliefs. And we think that we have a free exercise right to exemptions from the abortion restrictions when they conflict with our religious convictions about when life begins and when abortion is permitted or maybe even required. So maybe it's in the light of that that we've, it, you know, when, when Fulton was first handed down, it seemed to me it is just a matter of time before the Supreme Court overturned Smith. Now I'm not so sure. There, there may be a lot of benefit from the standpoint of the conservative agenda to holding on to Smith. Why? On the one hand, you can, they, they might be, not just, there are counter arguments to this, but one could use Smith's general rule that neutral laws of general application aren't subject to free exercise challenges to try to insulate laws prohibiting abortion from free exercise challenges. On the other hand, the other funky thing that happened in Fulton, which is really a culmination of something that the court was already developing in the 2020 term in its shadow docket with respect to the aforementioned COVID cases. Remember I said Smith itself recognized an exception for situations where there's a mechanism whereby the government can make individualized governmental assessments of whether a private party um, has to abide by the neutral general rule or whether uh, they will be exempted. And both in the COVID cases and then even more so in Ful Fulton, many of the justices interpreted that exception <laughs> to mean that any time there's a law, any time there's an exception to the law, any kind of exception. Or even, and even if no exemption has ever been granted before, as was the case in Fulton, if the government that has the authority to implement the law has the authority to make exemptions, then it's not a neutral law of general application. It's not a law to which Sherbert's general rule of insulation from free exercise challenge applies. Rather, it goes into the basket to which Sherbert's strict scrutiny applies. So if you interpret Sherbert that, uh, Smith that way, which I would say constitutes both a mis misinterpretation of Smith and a, mis a misinterpretation of its Sherbert exception, but that's just my opinion, if that's the court's interpretation, uh, you can use the, this so-called exception for cases where there are exceptions to characterize any law where you want to apply strict scrutiny as being a law that's not neutral and generally applicable. But if you want to insulate a law from free exercise challenge, as I wager there are a lot of people who would like to insulate abortion restrictions from free exercise challenges, then you can just invoke Smith's general rule. So, you know, maybe conservatives might want to keep Smith, although this is a very different version of Smith from the one that many liberals want to. Okay, but there are people who are, and I count myself among them, who are engaged in earnest efforts to come up with an alternative to both Smith and the conventional understanding of Sherbert as a kind of categorical strict scrutiny regime. I'm not the only one. So others, for example, my very respected colleague Nelson Tebbe published a forward in the last, uh, the last forward of the Harvard Law Review, I think another 
companion piece and maybe Columbia Law Review, putting forth his version of, of the third way. And it, I think it's pretty representative that there are a lot of other people. Um, they, they tend to have the following elements. Um, one, uh, as Professor Tebby says, a moderated level of scrutiny. So not strict, but not just rational basis and not nothing, which is what you get under Smith's general rule. Moderated. But, you know, that's not necessarily going to insulate civil rights ordinances from challenge. In fact, even the compelling state interest isn't, because the court's assessment of how compelling or how weighty the state's interest is, and whether it's weighty enough to override, uh, to overbalance uh, the interest in the free exercise of religion, as Justice Scalia says, that's a very, it's, it's very difficult to, to prevent judges from making that assessment in a way that doesn't reflect their priors, their biases. Maybe not consciously, maybe it's unconscious bias. So Professor Tebby says, in order to prevent that from happening, we need to have basically a pre-commitment. It's gonna be built into this test that the state's interest in enforcing civil rights statutes is weightier than the free exercise interest. I mean, okay. I mean, well, I'll leave it to you to ponder the likelihood of the court agreeing to that pre-commitment and well, I'll leave it to you to think about that. He also suggests that you need to have built into the test uh, uh, a principle that if, a, if granting a religious exemption will cause harm to third parties, not just undermine state interests, but actually will, will violate the rights of other people, um, that that is a limiting principle. These are nice ideas. I'm sympathetic to them. I can't imagine a world in which the Supreme Court is going to agree to them. Um, or, and I can't really imagine why, why they should. So let me end with my position, which, as I said, um, I don't know, maybe crazy. This first time I, one of the first time staying in public. Here's my view. I think we don't have to choose between Sherbert and Smith because I think, even though it is the conventional wisdom that Smith held that any state action that substantially burdens the exercise of religion is subject to strict scrutiny, including all neutral laws of general application. And therefore, whenever the state is deemed to have failed to demonstrate a compelling state interest, or even if it's deemed to have succeeded, if, it, if, if the court decides that there are less restrictive means of achieving that state interest, an exemption must be granted. I think the idea that that's what Sherbert said and stands for is this wrong. I challenge you, go back and look, actually read Sherbert v. Berner. Nowhere, nowhere does it say that all neutral laws of general application are subject to strict scrutiny. Nowhere does it say that laws that aren't neutral and of general application are subject to its rule, which is that an accommodation needs to be granted when a law as applied to a private party interferes with, substantially burdens the exercise of their constitutionally protected rights. It doesn't say that anywhere. Um, I don't, I've been looking, this is sort of, I'm not a historian, I'm trying to find the origin of this mistaken interpretation of Sherbert. You know, who did, who and where? I can tell you by the time I was in law school in 1984, 
but I believe well before that. <clears throat> every treatise, every horn book, you guys said you guys probably don't have Gilberts anymore, every student, got, I mean, that was just, that's what Sherbert said. That's not what Sherbert said. That's just not what he said. Here's my interpretation of what Sherbert said, and I'll leave you with this, because I know we're about out of time. Maybe there'll be time for at least one question. So I'm not gonna fully develop my position. I'll leave the last five minutes, and I'm happy to linger if people want to talk more after. Um, I think Sherbert is best read as having identified a subset of laws, regulations, that are neutral, and generally applicable. And it said those, not all neutral, generally applicable laws. This subset of neutral and generally applicable laws, if they burden the exercise of religion, they should be subject to strict scrutiny. And if the court can't demonstrate a compelling interest that can't be achieved through less restrictive means, then their exercise of religion needs to be accommodated by the government. What is the subset? These are situations that are characterized by what I call blind spot discrimination. Blind spot discrimination is a species of unintentional discrimination. Right? What was going on in the Sherbert case? The Seventh-day Adventists' ability to engage in the observance of Sabbath on Saturday was burdened by a whole network of employment regulations and unemployment regulations that had the effect, basically they embodied the then regnant mainstream cultural norm, mainstream Christian norm of day of rest on Sunday. And they protected a day of rest on Sunday in much like the Sunday closing laws cases that, whose constitutionality was addressed two years before in ways that substantially burdened the exercise of uh, Saturday Sabbath observers. Did they do that on purpose? Exactly the opposite. That was a consequence of a blind spot, of a failure to see a failure to think about, a failure to consider how these rules would affect Saturday Sabbath observers, and whether it was possible to accommodate their practice without undermining the legitimate interests and needs uh, that the, the rules and questions were serving. And it, it's, it's really, if you think about it, it's a kind of political process failure. It's a, it's a political process, it's a process defect theory but that is being applied to a process failure that is not intentional in nature. You're not talking about the intentional disfranchisement of an insular and discrete minority. You're talking about the unintentional. I think that is the correct reading of Sherbert. I think that reading of Sherbert constitutes a correct interpretation of the free exercise clause that we absolutely should reclaim, but it doesn't require overturning Smith. That interpretation of Sherbert, protection for that form of unintentional discrimination is totally consistent with Smith's general rule. Because not all neutral laws of general application that have the incidental effect of burning the, burning the exercise of religion are the product of the blind spot. I'm going to end with that because we're just about out of time. Formally, we have one minute for a question, so I'm happy to stay a little longer if anybody wants. That's my line, and I'm sticking to it, but I welcome not only here and now, but if anyone wants to email me, come and talk to me, I'd really welcome feedback. Any, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so there are, like, I, I don't think this is like God's gift. Um, 
But I would say, number one, they have to have some evidence. So for, first of all, the easy case. In cases where there's, like, there's just, it's implausible. I mean, there's no way in the circumstances of the Sherbert case that I, I just don't think any such evidence would be availing. And I'm sure, then there will be protection, okay? I think your case, but I think your question is actually raising a more general challenge to my position, which is how, how good, how effectively can, the, it might be a good theory, but can it really be administered and enforced by courts? And one problem is it just might be too easy to come. And it might be, I'm not sure, I haven't worked this, it might be that the answer to that is, you know, maybe this is a principle for which we have to look beyond the courts, right? That it, 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 and I'll give you an analogy uh, for those of you who've taken uh, local government law or real estate law um, and are familiar with ex you know, either exclusionary zoning cases or environmental cases. Sometimes, in recognition of the limits on the ability of courts to vindicate a principle similar to the one that I'm proposing, which is really a process failure remedy, what the courts say is not we're going to apply to strict scrutiny and think. What the courts say is you have to engage in, in the case of environmental, an environmental impact study. You have to demonstrate that you engage or in exclusionary zoning. You, have, you local government have to engage in a study of what the effects of your zoning law will be on the surrounding communities. That's a process solution to a process failure. And so if they haven't done so, then the challengers win. Um, and what it does is, I mean, it's not a, you know, we can all imagine the ways that that's going to be circumvented, but at least it's more robust protection than what we have. So, so maybe, it's something I've been toying with, is to say, maybe really we want to recognize the principle that I'm talking about but maybe the remedy isn't the application of strict scrutiny and judicially mandated accommodations, but a mandate to governments to engage in a cultural impact analysis. Could that be engaged in a way that gets captured and subverted? Sure, but I think it's, I think it's better than all of the alternatives I have submitted to you. But thank you, that's a really excellent question. Anybody else, if you want to linger a couple minutes after? We're officially over, so if anybody wants to go, welcome to go. If anybody has a question, I'm happy to answer.